we are now recording. Thanks for coming today. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, lecture capture. And we'll talk a bit about the general issue around lecture capture and what we've been doing here so far at New College in terms of um, some piloting that we're, um, of, of some technology and also um, t a little bit talk a, bit, a little bit about where we're looking at going in the future. So um, if you have questions, please, please um, jump in. Uh, it's meant to be very interactive. And also, um, if you, um, uh, we have some people in the room who've actually used the, some of this equipment and use some other equipment. And again, let's make this interactive. So, so a bit of background. Um, there's been interest in capturing, in doing lecture, lecture capture or some uh, by students, uh, basically for the purpose of reviewing materials taught in class. So we're not looking here at distance ed. We're not looking at um, people not being able to avoid going to class necessarily. Um, but we're looking at it more as the idea that, again, you know, I'm taking a class and it would be good to be able to review these materials before the midterm, the final, or, you know, I'm sitting in a calculus class and we're talking about theta and I zoned out during the discussion of theta and I don't know how to even look that up in the back of the book, right? So let me watch that part of that lecture over again. So from that perspective, I think it actually works well in this environment um, to say that we're going to capture the materials for the people in the class. They can go back and review that material. Could we eventually look at this for dis look at distance um, ed solutions? Certainly, that's a broader additional discussion that needs to take place. Um, there has been some experimentation in the past. We've had cameras in rooms that have just, again, been set up sort of in the back of the room type thing. Um, and we've had some faculty um, who've done some mini recordings on some specific topics um, and then, and say, loaded up those videos to, uh, to YouTube. So we have been sort of playing with some of this technology. We're trying to get a little more um, focused around how to do it, more formal and how we do it. So our requirements. Our first requirement is that it's be simple to use, because if it's not simple to use, no one's going to use it. That's true of faculty. That's true of staff. That's true of everyone. It needs to be simple to use. We want something that's flexible. Um, again, partially we want something that's very flexible, because if it's not flexible, again, we have different size teaching spaces. We have different ty size types of rooms, different types of classes. So we want to keep this very flexible, whatever solution we come up with. Um, cost effective, because cost is important. And we want the opportunity to experiment before we sort of make any kind of major investments. Okay. So right now, what we've been doing is we've been doing some simple lecture capture, but you know, we have not dealt with the fact that rooms need better audio, rooms need better lighting. We need to deal with you know, how do you capture something that's written on the board? Can you capture something that's written on the board? So we want to make sure that you know, we can do some experimentation at reasonably low risk before we move forward. So we've been looking at some solutions. Um, we have spoken to users at some of the other SUS institutions. Um, so I've talked to people at UCF and FSU about what they've used. And you know, there's a broad range of solutions out there. Also, um, um, Sarasota Manatee up the road here. So we've talked to people um, at various institutions around, around what type of solutions they're using. Um, we have talked and reviewed um, some providers for both shorter term and longer term solutions um, because we need to, again, look at what are we trying to, what problem are we trying to solve here. And uh, what we did for now is we've picked a low cost solution to sort of pilot this fall just to sort of get our feet wet. Okay. That solution is called a swivel. And uh, you're seeing it follow me around the room here a bit. And this is what it looks like um, in hand. It's a nice little device. It can be mounted on a tripod. And what it does, it actually works with an iPad, an iOS, any iOS device, or an Android device. You just stick it in here in a slot. Um, and it, there's an application that runs on that device that actually records the video, and you use that to upload the video afterwards. So it's very easy to use because basically if you can click and open up any kind of you know, iPad or Android app, you pretty much have figured out how to use it. So that, that's like 80% of it right there. Okay, so it's, it's pretty simple to use. And it has um, a couple of parts. It has the base, which is the little robot that turns around and also does all the sort of navigating of... Uh, keeping it in, in, in focus for you. And then there's a little device which actually hides inside. And it's this little fob, um, which has a few buttons on it. One is an advancement to uh, move the slides back and forth. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The other is to, uh, to turn on recording or not. Um, and it also has a built-in microphone. So the person who's speaking, you actually get very good audio 
because they're holding it either in their hand, have it you know sort of clipped on, or wearing it around their neck, sort of that style. I'm not a big around the neck person, so I'm, I'm going to hold it instead. Um, it's small, it's portable, it captures audio, it captures the video, and it also captures slides, and we'll talk more about the slide capture. Okay. So piloting, um, we've done a couple of things. We recorded it some mini classes, and uh, this was truly last minute because we got the device about three days before mini classes began. And Uzi, Miriam, Pat McDonald, and Dave Mullins agreed to um, pilot it at, uh, at mini classes, and we literally sort of were figuring out as we brought it into the room. Um, and um, those actually went pretty well, um, and we learned a bit there. And throughout the semester, we've had two recordings going this semester. Doug, Doug Langston has been recording classical philosophy, um, and he's doing that without slides, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And Pat McDonald's been doing Introduction to Calculus, and uh, he is actually using slides, which is a change in the way he usually teaches, because he doesn't usually use slides when he teaches calculus. Um, but he's actually using them here, and there are pros and cons. So how does it work? Okay. So to use the Swivel, the first thing, if you are using slides, you actually go to log into the Swivel website, and I'll show you this in a few minutes, I'll log in, um, where you basically take your PowerPoint presentation or a keynote presentation, whatever it is, it could be PDFs, you save them as images, just JPEG files. And then you just literally um, go to this website, swivel.cloud.swivel.com, log in with your account, drag them there, and it will um, automatically upload them to the device. Once on the device, it, it uploads, uploads it to their cloud. You then open up the Swivel app on your device. So there's the Swivel app on my iPad. Open it up. You say you want to either capture just video or capture video and slides. When you're capturing video and slides, it will show you any um, slides, that, any, anything you've already done. Um, but if you want to... Uh, Use a set of slides. You look at you find the set of slides in the app, and just hit present. When you hit present, it goes to the screen that looks like that. And to get started, basically you can click that button right there, which is the record button, or you can use the little record button on the fob itself, which is typically what you do. Okay. And while it's recording, that that uh, little white spot there is actually blinking red. So as I'm watching it now, I'm seeing it blinking red, so I know it's recording. Now, I'm doing this a little bit differently than we've been doing it in Pat's class with the slides. Um, in his class, he's actually using PowerPoint and the swivel to capture the slides separately. Um, here, I actually am in, have it integrated, so I'm actually just presenting off of the swivel, off of the iPad that's doing swivel. We have to add a little extra technology to that. We need an Apple TV in the room. We need to make sure the network's all working. So this is still very beta. Um, we're not really ready to start rolling with this yet, but it seems actually reasonably solid. So I'm only having to advance here. In Pat's class, one of the things he's having to do is sort of run back and forth to the computer and the device and make sure they stay in sync, and that does get a little bit, I think, a little bit hairy. Doug is not doing slides, which I think makes that life, that part easier. You're basically, once you get it started, you can keep going. Um, we'll talk more. Okay. Uh, you do your capture, you do your lecture. When you're all done, uh, you basically stop it, uh, you go back to the app, and there'll be a little icon that looks like a little cloud up, right, up going up. You uh, hit the little cloud up. It will upload it to the Swivel cloud uh, server. Uh, it will do some processing on it. Once it processes that, it will send you an email saying, hey, it's done. You can then go in and go to, their, to the website, and you'll find your presentation there. If, again, if you didn't do slides, you'll see just the video. Here's one of Doug's. Okay. Um, here's the one I did a few weeks ago. Um, you'll see the slides and the presentation. And they've actually literally, this uh, came out of beta yesterday, and they've actually added a bunch of features, which Scott and I were trying to figure out late yesterday and today. Um, so uh, there's a couple of new ones. But uh, you have the ability to share a video. And when you share a video, you can keep it on their cloud, share it right from there. What you can do is either share it to a specific person or to a group of people, um, or to the world. And when you share it to the world, or publicly, it's not really public. What it is is you get a URL that you can then um, place, say, in Moodle, um, or email to someone that they can see it. So it's not something that's indexed by Google or something like that. So it's not going to be easily found. But then you can share that video out. Um, a couple of other features now are to produce um, the video and um, to export. 
Okay. So if I click on produce, I can now come in and actually edit the slides with the video and it gives me the ability to do some fine tuning if I missed a slide or I want to delete a slide or I want to change some stuff around. I can do some editing there. I can do some cropping at the beginning and the end of the video. So again, often one of the things that you tend to do when you start one of these is you're looking down at the clicker um, and you hit the record button. So the first thing on the video is you staring down you know, at the floor. Uh, so you can clean up some of that stuff very easily and it's just sort of drag off the first couple of seconds or drag off the last few seconds of it at the end. So you can do those type of things. Um, you can um, say you want to produce it for export. And when now, this is a new feature that's just been added. So now when you export it, um, the, you have an option of how do you want the, if you're using slides, um, how do you want the slides and video to appear? So I can say I want it to mostly be the video with the slides in the corner. Or I can say I want it to be mostly the um, slides with the video in the corner, uh, whichever way I wanted, or side by side, sort of giving an equal, equal weight. Um, or I just want the um, slides and the audio. So I don't want any uh, video, I just want slides and audio. This could be useful if you're recording, say, doing in, in sort of a flip mode, uh, where you're not necessarily in a room, but you're trying to do an audio lecture. So you can use an audio lecture, put slides up and the audio, but you're not in the video. Um, and again, this is a, a new feature that's just been added. You hit start once you selected which one you want. It goes off for a while. It processes it generally pretty quickly. Um, an hour takes about 10, 15 minutes to process. The actual upload is I think we're looking at about two to one. So if it's an hour long video, it takes about a half hour to upload, maybe a little less. They claim that they've now sped it up. Um, I haven't seen it. Scott probably has a better idea of that. Is there an upload since they sped it up? We'll, see. we'll find out after this. <laughs> we'll find out after today how long it takes. And I'm actually recording at, um, at, um, uh, at high quality. There's multiple different recording qualities. And depending, again, what you're doing, you might not need very high quality recording. Okay. So once it, it processes it, you can then come in and export it. Um, you can just click export at that point. Um, and here you go. I, I, I picked the, put the video in the corner here. So there's the presentation. Put the video in that corner. It does, um, when you're doing something like this, you do want to think about how you lay out your slides. Because I actually first, when I went to first go through this process this morning, I stuck the video up here and it was blocking out half the, half the slide. So I then went back and we did it that way, putting it in that corner. But it's something you need to sort of think about if you are using slides with this and you want video. Um, and you want to do that sort of video in slide type thing, you want to make sure that you, uh, you can do it that way. Um, you'll notice it says export. If you hit export now, it just downloads it to your computer. It's a .mov file. You can take that file now, upload it um, to Moodle. You can upload it to YouTube um, manually or some other sharing service if you want. You'll see up here it says, please, uh, more export options to come. YouTube coming soon. So sometime in the next few weeks, there should be a direct export to YouTube. So we can put things up, say, to a private YouTube channel, put that link into Moodle, and your students in your class can get direct access to it. Questions? And then when it's done, again, you get the video and you can see it sort of all. there. So the recording is captured on the iPad in the swivel. On the iPad, yeah, the swivel itself doesn't capture anything. It it just it it just passes it through. Uh, you'll notice there's a little wire sticking out of the swivel. Um, the little wire is actually an audio cable because you get better audio quality instead of just using the speaker on the iPad. The microphone in the swivel um, device here talks to the swivel, passes the audio through. But everything is stored on the iPad. Once you've uploaded it to the swivel cloud, you can then delete it from the iPad. You can keep it there. You can actually save it to the um, photo roll on the iPad as well. Um, and it will just save the video itself. It won't save the slides if you're doing slides and video. But it will save the video itself and you can process it further as well. Yep, so you have PowerPoint. So that's on Correct. So no, the Swivel app is this is uh, this, this here is actually not an app. This is just a website. Okay, so the Swivel website on your PC, and you just um, in PowerPoint there's an option to export um, slides to 
just images, I think, or something like that. I don't remember the exact terminology. Um, and when you do that, it's a JPEG, and you, you, pick, you pick JPEG. If you're using Keynote on a Mac, I know it's because it's, I did it this morning, X save as images, um, save them as JPEGs. And then you just take that whole folder's worth and drag it up there, and that takes a couple of minutes to upload. So that, that part's quick, easy. Um, what you don't have is you don't have any kind of animation in slides, right? So you have to think about that. So again, when I was doing slides here, I was drawing circles around items beforehand instead of, you know, if I was doing this as a presentation, I might have that animate in. I can't do that here. That's because when I did a poor job of, of blowing them up. <laughs> that was me. Yes, yes. That's me more than, than the device. Because you notice the text on the slide itself is fine. It's just the image. I just didn't blow it up hard, large enough. That's actually a little better. Can you put any size in, uh, image in there? Yep. Yep. Okay. So, um, yes. So next steps. Uh, we're continuing to pilot and evaluate. Again, we have um, Doug and Pat who have been using this semester, and they'll continue to use it. If people want to use it sort of for one-up type things, we have it a third device sitting here. Um, and we partially have it as a backup, but again, if people want to try to experiment with it and, and play with it, we're happy to let you use it. Um, you notice we're using iPad minis with this. Um, these are newer model iPad minis. Apparently this afternoon they won't be as new. Um, but they're, at the moment, the, the latest iPad mini, which has a, a better quality camera than, say, the iPads 2s that we have floating around campus as well. So the better camera, obviously, the better quality you're going to get. Um, so that's, that's not a bad thing to look into. But we are looking at, we are still piloting. We want to begin piloting some other solutions. This is a really nice, simple, low-cost, um, flexible solution. If we're really going to get more serious about doing lecture capture with any potential in the future of doing some distance ed, we need to look at the spaces we're working in. Um, you know, we do this in, uh, Pat's doing this in Che. Che has terrible lighting, right? And it's a big room, and if you have people in the back asking questions, you're not going to hear them. So we really need to look at how do we outfit those rooms appropriately with, you know, proper lighting, with better audio, um, with fixed cameras probably around the space as well to, to pick up other, other activity in the room. Um, so we need to understand, uh, understand that. And we are looking at some other solutions. There's a product um, from a company called Kaltura, which is a more broad solution. It works with the computer that's actually sitting in the room instead of um, using like an iPad or something like that. It uploads from there. You can actually do things offline. It can do closed captioning, all of those type of nice capabilities um, that as we go forward we want to look at. Uh, it's another product called Tegrity. We're looking at, at those two right now. And both are in use at other SUS institutions. So we're trying to get a better feel for what's out there and what, what makes the most sense to use going forward. Um, then we also, again, we need to understand interest from faculty and students in this and funding because uh, you know some of these solutions are less expensive than others, but they're not cheap. All the solutions we're looking at are cloud-based solutions. So we're not looking at any kind of server-based thing here. Um, both Kaltura and Inte Integrity and the other ones out there all upload the video like this one does to a cloud-based uh, server, uh, cloud-based host. Um, and you can then have security in how it's shared from there. Um, and then again, looking at the space on campus for lecture capture. Again, I look at Che as an ideal type of space for that. It does, we have lectures there. Um, and it is a big space that sort of makes sense to do that in. But there are other rooms on campus. We might want to do one or two ACE rooms. We might look at like the Library 209, which actually has a control room in it um, from the old days of lecture capture here um, in the USF days. Um, maybe HCL8. Um, so there are some other rooms around campus we might want to look at. Um, Outfitting, and we're, we are actually trying to get some quotes on costs to do some of that outfitting in terms of lighting and sound and, and, and other equipment. Um, and then, we again, we need to outfit that space and determine the staffing needs as appropriate because um, while we're trying to make this simple, we know that there are going to be some staffing requirements if we are going to take this more seriously going forward in terms of, you know, at doing some level of editing. Um, the tools we're looking at all have the ability that the person who's creating it, the instructor, can edit. Um, but there'll still be, need to be some support for that. 
questions. Is there anything that they have for closed captioning? I know that's they don't weird. at this point. No, at this point, um, uh, there's no closed captioning as part of this. Mm -hmm. Now, you can. there are services that will closed caption. Right. Um, there are plugins that we can probably find when you put, once you stick it up, say, on a YouTube video and do closed captioning through that. But by default, no. Yeah. No, it's not, at this point, not built in. Yeah. Um, these are, sm this is a small company. What's really nice about it is when Scott has a, an issue with something, he sends them an email and we get an email back pretty much right away and um, they fix things. So that, that's the good news. Um, the bad news is they're still, they're a small company. I mean, they have limited resources. So this one here I will um, share to everyone on campus, and I can give, show you a couple of clips of some of the other ones, and I can bring those up now just to give you some idea of what they're, they're like. Um, and, and again, the other thing is I think, you need to think we need to think about how does this fit into new college? How does it change your teaching style? And Doug, I think you know, you've now been using this for a couple of months. Does it change the way you teach? Sure. Things. Yep. Um, one thing that's sort of important um, is the recording um, device works well for the person giving the lecture, but you don't pick up questions from other people. I've done it both in a in room two hundred and fifty in the library, which is you know about this size, uh, and you can't hear the questions being asked. I did it in a smaller seminar room. I put the device sort of. Uh, equidistant from everyone, you still really couldn't hear. So this is a device that records you um, best, and the others are kind of lost. So that's a problem. Um, another problem is these buttons, which are required for it to track you and um, to record, don't always work well. Um, one you hold down for a long time, the other you just sort of briefly hit, and often it doesn't work. And when Alan said, um, if you press this and it blinks, that means it's recording, it, no. <laughs> no, on the, on the one where I couldn't get this going and I hit that and it was blinking, there was no sound. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there, there, are some, there are some problems there. The main problem, I find, is psychological. Uh, you know what it's like when you hear your voice you, and you say, oh, that's not me. Um, when you see yourself, I mean, you pick up, you've got a stiff neck, you pick up, you're balding, you pick up, um, you know, all sorts of, your, your mannerisms, and it's really depressing, uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, I, I have to say. Um, we were concerned whether it would pick up um, the chalk, because the, in 250, it's a regular blackboard with chalk, and that works great. Uh, you can actually, as much as students now can right. read cursive, um, you can you can actually read the the, the stuff uh, off off the video. So that that actually works well. I, I gather it works probably better than the slide. So um, you know, using the chalk thing, it, it stands out. Well, what's uh, interesting well. though about that is I think it works well in that room, and that one has blue boards. Yeah, and well, I think actually so. the blue board and the lighting in that room actually works reasonably well for it. You, the contrast um, on a blackboard, um, the Hubble telescope can't pick up the writing mm -hmm. in J. I mean, it is yeah. partially because the lighting light is so bad in the front of the room there. Right. But literally, the you know uh, you cannot pick it up at all because right. I tried that. Um, I was actually surprised how well it picks it up in yeah. in the library classrooms with the blue board, and I think it's just they're brighter rooms and. Uh, Contrast of blue, white on blue is actually works better than it, the black and white does. What about the whiteboards? Whiteboards are tough, also. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what about whiteboards? And again, your question won't be picked up. Again, this is part of the issue here. Um, whiteboards. It depends on the lighting in the room. I mean, it really does. It depends on the lighting in the room. I have not tried like the lighting, the, the whiteboard so much in Shea. I think part of the problem we have there is there. So even if people are sitting in that room, I think it's sometimes hard to see the whiteboard unless you sort of shut the front lights, in which case now you're filming a very dark room. So this is why I said that for like Che, to do lecture capture there properly, we need to outfit it, we need better lighting, we need audio mics to pick up questions around the room. 
Um, one thing we can do with this device to actually improve the recording of it is we can actually get multiples of these little devices and have a couple of them around the room to act as, as microphones. They won't work as additional tracking devices, but you can put one in a slave mode that, that will work yeah. as a mic. Right. So we can try that. Um, but, but it's still pretty limited. It's still discovered. limited in its yeah. range. And I think yeah. it's purposely limited yeah. in its range so that it doesn't right. pick up lots of background right. noise. The, in, sorry, I was just going to yep. say that in terms of, Alan asked about does it affect your teaching, and it, it does. I mean, partly there's a tripod in the room mm -hmm. um, that you're sort of aware of, and it makes it sort of difficult to sort of work around if you put your notes and, and whatnot. You try not to put it in front of the tripod, so you put it over there, and it just set, gets things um, a little disarranged from your sort of normal being able to have a space there that you talk from. So it, it, it's odd. You have to try it to sort of get a sense that it does affect you in odd ways, but it does. And then you're constantly aware, if you watch the video, of what you look like. And that's, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how strange that is um, for you. Sure. Sarah. Oh, yeah, I should just let me say, the reason I'm doing it in classical philosophy, originally I had something like 70 people enrolled in the class, and I was trying to figure out how I could handle that. And um, when it got down to 50, I came up with the idea that I always do a special advanced session for more advanced students. Um, so I thought that I could um, get down the numbers of people in the actual class if I recorded the class and made the video available to older students who could watch the video rather than come to class, and I could deal just with the beginning people, sort of essentially separate them. Um, turned out that there, there are only 30 people in the class, so that really didn't become an issue. But that was my original idea. And it struck me as a good solution that you could, with a selected group, have have them do the video, and then you could talk at a, at a session about what's going on in the video, presupposing that they had seen the video. And you could do more intensive work there than you would do in a, a lecture with less advanced students. So that's, so, that's a use. But, so even in that instance, your real intent is for them to hear your lecture, right? As opposed to necessarily well, the students Question and answer. That, right, no, this is, this is the difficulty with this microphone that, in fact, after I saw the first one and realized that it didn't pick up, then you pretty much realized that you were offering a lecture that people would listen to. If, if you, uh, in, I, I did, I take one of my special sessions, um, which is much more interactive, and it didn't work very well because you couldn't really hear the other people. So the limitation of the microphone requires it to be more a lecture format than a discussion format. But, uh, which right, and, and the reason I ask is, uh, my, in my mind, most online courses is a lecture format, right? right? It's right. A, professor lecturing, right. and then the ones who are, that are hybrid, you people go to the lecture and then come together and discuss, and then there's no lecture, there's nothing on the board, it's a very different kind of framework. Right, there. right. But the intent is a lecture, and that's why I was kind of wondering right. as to the intent for, yeah. they need to hear the audience, but I think you had a different program in mind. I did, but it didn't, but it really didn't work, um, and so... You're right, by default, it, it really is more lecture mode. And in fact, what I've used it now is when I've had a couple of students who had family emergencies had to go out of town, so I shared the video with them so they could see the class that they couldn't attend because of the family emergency. Mm -hmm. So it was, so essentially it's a backup right now for the students. And that, that works, I mean, you kind of have to weigh the sort of disruption to how you teach and what you're going to emphasize, lecture as opposed to discussion, um, versus the fact that some people can't make it all the time, and how do you s satisfy that need? So that's kind of the balance. Well, the question that I had was, 
that some people might use the fact that the now it's available online. Right, and they won't show up. up. Right, no, and, and, right, you know, right. And, and, no, right. That, and, that's right. And, yeah. and Steve Miles and I had a conversation about this before we started this process this summer, saying how does this fit into New College? And the approach that we were talking about where we think it does fit in is the, again, I did go to class, but it would be useful for me to see this video again because I missed some sort of point or just reinforcement or, again, students with special needs, what, you know, those type of situations. But not, so, not the idea that, okay, I, now I can, you know, sleep, sleep in in the morning and not come to class. Um, so, again, and you can handle that partially by, sele by selectively sharing by not saying you're not going to share it with everyone, um, or by again saying, well, if you don't come to class, it's still not coming to class. The fact that you've watched the lecture doesn't get you off the hook. Um, so you, but, but how does this work here? I think that's an issue. I think to Doug's point about um, the audio, right, right now this works much better as a lecture um, environment where you're talking, it, you, maybe you're presenting something, but it's a lecture. Or again, I think it actually works reasonably well in a flipped mode where you're recording the information prior, sending it out to students, and then having the discussion. Not necessarily recording the discussion, but that's a different issue. Um, but getting it out and using it for, as, as that capture tool for flipping, for flipping a classroom, where it falls short definitely is in discussion because of audio. Now, again, we can have multiple mics for audio pickup. That might help. But again, the range is still going to be limited, and it depends on the space. You know, If you're in a small room in ACE, um, That'll probably work reasonably well, so it's not one of the rooms with a lot really loud air conditioning. It doesn't. It's it, Detroit, yeah. Right, but I mean, if you had if you had additional a couple oh, of additional, additional mics, um, it's still even. You know, you go into CHE or HCL8, uh, you know, HCL8 or something like that. You know, you can't have enough mics in that space that you're going to pick it up. And that's just the reality. One of the things um, I found, I mean, doing kind of the same kind of thing is just repeating the question. Right. So you do have to get right. So you get into that yeah, teaching yeah. mode of yeah. saying, "I'm going to repeat the question." So, you right. Tell people like this isn't weird. I'm really repeating. Right, and and, and some right. Don't know whether it's recording or not. Right. right. So that right. people like, couldn't hear the other. Right. Student. So uh, again, yeah, and that's and that's the, you do sort of get into if if you're going to try to use it in a more interactive mode, you do have to get into the repeating or at least summarizing the question yeah, mode to use it. It's the summarizing. Right. The kids gonna get upset. Oh. No. You, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah. It is what you actually meant. But. <laughs> I'm just a comfortable distance now, so I'm taking up half the frame, um, or not even. Um, so, um, it, let's see if that works. Yes. So I can do this also. So, as you see. Um, yeah, we'll actually go up. Um, so, yeah, let's see if this works. What about down? It'll go, yeah, I mean, it, it, if it goes below the table, it's going to eventually lose the lose sight of it. Now, the other thing that you can do... If need to do it down, Yep, actually, just put it down. Yeah, you can just put it down, which works reasonably well, except now it's you're recording my, my crotch. Um, but in, on, in a regular room... Yep, in a regular room, what, so what you can do, and yeah, yeah. yep, you could have the tripod lower, and again, right, yeah. if you don't want it to follow you, the best thing to do is assuming you're staying within reasonable range with the microphone, and again, like even in Che, anywhere in the front there, your reasonable range, as long as you speak up. Um, I just put it down on the counter, and it'll just stay focused on whatever it's focused on at that point. Using this for a flip, uh, what would be the best way to use it for a flip? I, I assume I would just go find a classroom and try to s set this up as if there were students in the room. Uh, what would be the best way? To so how, how do you how do you flip with this? I, I, there's a couple of ways. One is if you are doing the flip more as a lecture, you can certainly just do the slides sitting at your desk and record the audio over them. If you're doing more experimental things where you want to be able to show, then I think you do have to sort of go into a classroom, you know, the no one there type classroom and do it. Well, if you're just doing slides and recording audio, do you need that device? What's nice about this device is it does keep things in sync nicely. So it's a nice tool for that because, again, if I want to sort of keep the slides going as I'm talking, 
I can easily do that. Um, so that's kind of nice. Um, it does have the ed some editing tools associated with it. It does do a good job with the audio in that type of environment. Um, and if I want to do some visual, anything really interesting, sort of cut back and forth and do some of that. So there are advantages to this. I mean, again, it's, it, you could certainly just record using a camera or an iPad or an iPhone or, you know, an Android or something like that. Mm -hmm. What this does, it does give you a bit more control over it and a bit more structure. Um, again, this ability to integrate the slides in as you're going. Um, is it required? No, you can certainly flip in other ways. Uh, if you, say, make a mistake, uh, it's already up to the cloud. Uh, you can edit. You can edit? Yeah, so, so I, at this point, I know that you can edit, um, you know, beginning and end. Um, you can download the video. It's a video file that you can edit. Um, they are adding additional capabilities to do mid mid, mid uh, file edits. That's not there yet. Um, but again, they've been adding new features pretty quickly. Again, the other solutions that we're looking at longer term, Kaltura and Integrity, those two specifically, all have um, video editing capabilities built right in where you can go in and say, you know, at the 10 minute mark, you know, you, there's a flub or, you know, you don't want that, you know, part of the discussion in that video. You can go in and edit it out, or add additional video if you want. I guess this heads towards: um, is the original one still there? Yes, you can save the original. It it the, the original. So the original when you upload it, you upload it. Right now, we're uploading these into a common account. Going forward, what we'd rather do is upload them into. You would just log in with your uh, an ID that has on their cloud. The video is controlled by you. It's not shared until you hit the share button. So the original's there, but you can download it, save it, take, put it away, or you can share it to your heart's content. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Part, part of the question sort of comes on the ownership of the file. That's a question that the, um, is a, above my pay, pay grade. <laughs> Let me point out a little bit about that issue. The this year, the union is negotiating the full contract. That means that we open the piece of the labor contract that addresses issues of um, what you call intellectual property. So we will be addressing those things. I think it's important that faculty who are thinking of starting to move in this direction that you come to us, uh, your bargaining team, and let us know what are the concerns, what are the issues, so that we can make sure that we have the right kind of contract to protect property. And, and the BOG has their own ideas on this because I've, oh, yeah, I've attended some things. Um, and I think that, you know, we need, we, we, we need to understand, and, and that is an issue that needs to be understood. I think there's also issues around um, capturing students in a class. Um, mm -hmm. Do we need to get releases for that? Again, in this pilot stage, we've been mm -hmm. avoiding that issue, but I think it, you know, I think we do. I think we, you know, but, but again, that's something that we need to... Um, as, as an institution, look into right and decide. Capturing I'm capturing these guys. They don't have a employee, but students do. And I mean, students have to say they don't want to be recorded. Um, and how does that play in? I, you know, not not me. Right. Right. So, and, and these are questions that we, we're, we're asking. Um, we need to get answers, obviously, before we would roll this out in a broader way. Of what are the privacy issues? What are the intellectual property issues? Um, these are issues I brought up uh, first thing with, uh, when, I, when this topic came up during the summer, because I am concerned about it. A couple of quick things, too, and for file management and just for security, too, uh, you would keep, keep your own files, I would imagine, since you have the ability to download it just yep. as a backup. Right, you can download these files, and in fact, we've been doing that, is, is we, we can download them, um, you can save them to the device, or you can download them to your computer, and... Um, can, you, can you download the edited one with the... Now you can, uh, as of today, or yesterday. You can now do that. Before today, you could only download the video, or the sli well, the slides are separate. Now you can actually do what I did here, which is the combined... Just method. for the heck of it, I sent a file up, mm -hmm. to see if the file that was already edited... So once you've edited something else, if you've got other things that you've already completed, you say, I want to put that up as well, apparently you can. So yes. 
yeah, there, there's, there are a bunch of tools there. And again, you don't have to use their cloud long term. You can just use that as a temporary way station, mm -hmm. get the files up there, download them. We can put them either in a different service or, you know, something like YouTube or Vimeo or something of that nature or some other private cloud service um, where you have or just, you know, put it on your computer um, and let them share it that way. Make a DVD. Want to go old school? Uh, we we can probably do VHS. Just as a side point, Pal. Uh, it occurred to me that this technology would also be very helpful from the perspective of faculty development. Um, when you were talking about the experience of being film, that is an experience that that I had as a graduate student when they were training us on the teaching and learning enhancement. The, you know, program, in fact, records the faculty as they're teaching so that you get to see yourself doing it. And you can, in fact, capture certain things that you never realize, how you hold your arms, how you, you know, how you move, how you, you know, face the audience. And that speaks to, to, those are things that we didn't used to do. And I think having this technology so mobile makes it a very nice and, and resource. For the presentations and, you know, training them to the presentation so they could see themselves so going, um, um, basically, yeah. So, with the mobility. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, one of the things that um, I know that UCF and some of the other schools do is before faculty are actually allowed to do di any kind of distance ed, they have to go through some sort of certification process and that is largely around how do they present in front of a camera, again, to Doug's point of it's different. It makes you feel different, you behave differently, you act differently. How do you become more natural you're at that? And you're there's a lot more on stage. There's a and there's a training process. I think that we, you know, if we're going to do this more seriously, we need to, we need to understand. Right, exactly. Well, right, exactly. Your people get to. That's right. Um, so there's that issue. Um, I think. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of faculty development and such, I think, again, one of the reasons that I like this device that we got for now, whether we, you know, this is as far along as we ever get with lecture capture or we do more full-blown system, is it is portable, and if you do want to use it for faculty development or other meetings, you know, it's really easy to carry one of these around, okay. bring it into a room. I just said, this is, this is it. That's the case for it. This is the case for that. Um, it comes in this nice little case. Thing, the right. Right. So it's very efficient right. in three minutes to set it up. Right. Class. And depending on the room, you don't need the tripod. I mean, we have, you have a tripod in your room because, again, our rooms were not designed for this. Um, in certain spaces, you know, again, if you're around a seminar table, you might just put it right on the table. And the way I have that, you know, this one here sitting. Um, you know, there's no reason that you have to have it on the tripod. Um, right. No, I've had, um, I mean, speaking of, of the issue of training, I've seen some... Um, Courses that have been captured, like like video courses, sort of thing, that were so boring. Yes. The professor just standing in front of a board and just talking, not even using the board. And and yet, then I've seen others that have like amazing technology. Right. And I'm aiming to do that sort of thing. I think I've mentioned before. And I'm wondering what kind of resources do we have to be able to do that? What do I have in mind? We, we don't have any right now. <laughs> Talking about statistics, right? Sure. What is, for instance, the situation of inequality worldwide? And sure. being able to have a projection of a mm -hmm. map, I've seen these people who like are behind the screen mm -hmm. and there's a projection of world map and a table or, or you know a different kind of visual that explains and allows people to see visually here is the size of China, here is the size of Mexico, here is the size of how you know. So so Haiti. I think what, what you're really looking at there is you're looking at production. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at multi-camera production. You're looking at um, you're looking at, at really a studio, sort of more of a studio. Right. I mean, it, and if you watch, if you look at a, I mean, if you look at the difference today between a a MOOC today, like you know, on Coursera or edX mm -hmm. versus something say five six years ago, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the ones on Coursera and edX today are produced. They're multi-camera work. Um, they have projection. They have all of these things that are 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 doing that. They're well staffed to do it. 
Um, I was talking to someone at an FLVC meeting, and the numbers I'm hearing are, you're looking at something like an order of, say, $35,000 to produce a, a MOOC, you know, the production cost, to produce the course. Again, you have to stand not including the equipment and all that. That's assuming that's there. Do you really need, like, three cameras to do that kind of visual stuff? Sure, because you need something that's projecting, that's looking at the at whatever you're talking about, talking to, the projection. You need the um, one, that, one or two that's following you, something that's looking at students, because you probably do. Again, why, why are some of those lectures so painful? Because it is someone just standing there talking in a quiet room, right? Um, and, you know, it is, it's that old, you know, Ferris Bueller scene of the person just droning on. Um, so one thing I actually like about this camera is it does follow you around, so at least there is some visual interest. Um, and that was one of the reasons that we said we wanted to do the follow me, in addition to the ability to, again, hopefully pick up more content, be it the board or something like that. Um, but, again, yes, this, the one camera sort of fixed in the back of the room staring is sort of a painful... You know, no one pays attention after the first five minutes of it. Right? So. Yes. Also, the source, whatever you're coming from, an initial input you got there, too. Right. So, so one of the things that, um, again, the other tools that we're looking at have is the ability to have multiple sources come in. So, again, I could have the doc cam. I could have uh, the projector off of the computer instead of, again, having to upload them, say, to the iPad and use a special clicker. Um, I could just have the PowerPoint presentation being um, captured at the same time some other video is. So we are looking at ones that have, in a sense, this is two video sources right now. You have the, um, the slides and the one camera. Everything else we're looking at going forward is more like at least three or four sources. So you can have a video source as well as, and then, and then again, you can go through after and edit to your heart's content to say, you know, you want this particular piece of video or you want to focus on this or that. And some of the tools have the ability to say, um, you know, when I, when I export this now um, and it's going to export that video, say, into the corner of the screen, some of the other tools have the video ability so that the end user can say, I want to click and watch the, the instructor more or I want to click and watch the slides more, I want to click and watch that and, and open those windows up more broadly. So, again, there are certainly more sophisticated solutions. Again, they're much more elaborate in terms of um, supporting them and putting them together. The big thing, actually, for um, for this kind of thing is, is splitting up your lectures into little parts. They do it on Lydia, right. where they split all, everything up into, like, seven-minute chunks. Um, there's a psychology aspect to that, where, like, people only really want to pay attention for that minute to the thing. And so that the, the weird thing is you have to, like, introduce every new little section over and over again. And, and again, that, I think, works well in a flip mode. Right. Right. In a flip mode, you do want to do more shorter, generally. Little, little things. Right. And we have lynda.com, right, and our students use that. Um, faculty and staff can sign up for it. I sent out an email about that yesterday. Um, and we actually are getting five more seats uh, have just been approved, um, which are going to be for student use exclusively, because uh, we want them to do things like, you know, just skills like, you know, how do I do Excel, how do I do whatever. Um, but again, yes, those are very short little segments, and they're great because you can go in and say, hey, I need to figure out how to do a chart in Excel. I don't need to sit through four hours of Excel lecture to figure out how to do that. Um, but I can just go to that section, watch those four minutes of it, and if I need to go do a little more or, or less after that, I can do it. Um, instead of having to sit through again, you know, go to an intro Excel course, and, you know, they start with, you know, and across the top are, you know, numbers, and across the bottom are letters or whatever, um, vice versa. Um, where, how do you get people to the same level? So, again, we're even looking at using that in a flip mode, um, using those tools. So there are tools out there that you can integrate in as well. And obviously, we do that already to some extent. Any other questions? Um, I'll give you a, uh, yeah, I'm not even going to bother going to the cloud park. It's really just, I pretty much showed that to you. Um, I will actually take this lecture, and I will upload it, and I will share the link so you all be able to see how it all works. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.